So Kevin said I don't get a fancy introduction, so I'll introduce myself. Uh, I'm Brian Gettinger. I'm your presenter for the first block today. We're going to talk about transportation and technology, and hopefully this will be interesting. If it's not interesting, you can tell Kevin never to have me come back and talk ever again. Yeah, it's all Kevin's fault. So quick bio. Um, folks that didn't notice, I'm really tall. Cody's already trying to get me to play basketball with him. Probably worked that out. I like to win championships as well, so we can make that happen. Uh, I played basketball at UMKC. I graduated back in 2008, back when UMKC still played down at Municipal Auditorium, before the Sprint Center was there, which is now T-Mobile Center, before the light streetcar was in, all that kind of stuff. Um, so seeing a lot of things change. I currently live in Austin, Texas. Uh, I've lived kind of all over the US, work on different projects, and uh, civil engineer. Worked for Elon for a couple years. I led business development for his tunneling company, the Boring Company, uh, which was an interesting experience. Probably won't comment on that while I have the microphone in my hand, but we can talk about that later, maybe after the meeting. Um, I know a lot about tunnels. I could talk about tunnels for a long time. That's not really what this presentation is about, but it is sort of related uh, as a potential avenue for deploying transit or transportation projects underground. So. A history lesson to start. Uh, my wife makes fun of me for listening to audiobooks about history. I've got a Civil War one going on right now. Uh, I like listening to audiobooks and history is a good one. So brief history of transit in the United States. Um, the first horse-drawn omnibus was 1827. Um, it pretty rapidly increased from there. We got horse-drawn streetcars, which there were some of those here in Kansas City. Um, Cable-powered Electric Street Railway in Cleveland. First subway was in Boston. Boston and New York actually had a race to see who could build the first tunnel subway system in Boston 1, 1897. Um, monorail, 1962. Has anyone seen the Simpsons episode about the monorail? I, I felt like that guy before, pitching tunnels to people. Like, so hopefully that's not me today. Um, heavy rail in San Francisco. Um, everyone's heard the word BRT, or Bus Rapid Transit. The first one of those got built in Pittsburgh in the 70s. Um, and then the ADA came in and started to apply in 1990. So that changed a little bit of the, the landscape. Um, one thing that I think is important to note, you saw a lot of innovation happen in the first 100 years. Um, the FTA started really subsidizing transit in the 1970s. Um, sometimes innovation flourishes the most when there is a lack of funds or a lack of resources because people are forced to find ways to solve problems that are super efficient. Sometimes when we flood the market with funds, we become less interested in being creative. And I think that sort of happened in transit. FTA started pumping a lot of money. Uh, their first billion dollar year for FTA was in 1970s. Now we're looking at like 20, 30 billion dollars sometimes but for the FTA now. So by having so much money flowing, I think we've kind of cut down on some of the innovation that's happening in the transit space. So this is a map of Kansas City. Uh, we have the streetcar now. Again, Kansas City was one of the better run streetcar systems in the country uh, early 1900s. So first one, 1870s, over 50 million rides by the 1900s, 135 million rides in the 1920s. Now we're looking at a couple million people ride the streetcar a year, which is great, but we had a pretty expansive system. You know, the Great Depression really hurt that. Obviously, the Automobile hurt that. A lot of things kind of conspired to kill the streetcar system. But by the 1950s, we were tearing it out and moving on to buses. Uh, I think that's probably something that if you went back and looked at it, we would re regret as a city. Most cities feel that way. Um, but now the question is, how do we recreate that transit environment not spending a billion and billion and billion of dollars? So I said I'm from Austin. Austin's trying to build a project called Project Connect, which they passed a property tax bond for $7 billion to build it. And then they found out that it might cost $12 billion. And so they're trying to de-scope it. But the problem is people voted on a system that they wanted, and now they're going to get like a fourth of that system. And they're not very happy. So the question is, how do we build transit more efficiently but still make it super useful? So streetcar line, everyone's familiar with this probably. Uh, you know, As a UMKC grad, this would have been great when we were on campus because people maybe would have come to the basketball games that I played in downtown. We weren't exactly drawing a big crowd, um, which is why they play on campus now. But had the streetcar line existed all the way to UMKC, maybe they would have. Um, riverfront extension's happening. They're talking about going to North Kansas City as well. I think this is great. My presentation today is not to say this is a bad idea, 
but to say like, what else can we do now that this exists? How do we build East West, right? KU Med Center to the stadium complexes. How do we go to the airport? How do we get to, as a, someone from Overland Park, how do we get to people in Overland Park to use transit? Which is super challenging because everyone has a car or three in Overland Park. Um, how do we get some high, you know, high important corridors? So what is a 21st century transit vision? This is a, actually one of the renderings that Austin put together. Um, high capacity transit. You know, when people think high capacity transit, they think New York City subway or they think San Francisco BART. Um, they think these massive trains that are 300, 400 feet long, that can take thousands of passengers. And that's really useful if you're in those places or Tokyo or Toronto or Singapore. But most cities in the US don't look like that. They look like Kansas City or Austin or Indianapolis or Columbus and they're spread out. They have low population density and they can't afford something that costs hundreds of millions of dollars per mile. This system in Austin is projected to cost, was projected to cost 250 to $400 million per mile to build a light rail system. It might be $500 million a mile. Austin, it, even though Austin's had dramatic growth and they're building towers downtown like crazy, it doesn't have the density to support that, right? It's not, this is not cost effective. Now you could argue, hey, the streetcar here doesn't charge a fare. That's not cost effective either. But the streetcar is funded here differently, right? It's funded by taxes, property, property taxes and sale taxes around it. And it moves people back and forth. And it didn't cost $400 million a mile to build. But how can we make this cost $20 million a mile to build or $50 million a mile to build or some, some number that's all less than 400 so that places like Kansas City that are spread out, right? The airport is you know, 15 to 20 miles from downtown. How do we get something to the airport that doesn't cost $10 billion? Because if it costs $10 billion, it'll never go to the airport. This is not cost effective. So buses and trains are great. Buses and trains existed in 1950. There has to be more options. I won't always say better because it may depend, but there has to be more options now than what we had in 1950. We have better technology now. So like what else is on the, on the, the, on the board? I came up in my career working for engineering consultants. I was an engineering consultant. I guess I kind of still am. I work for a contractor now. Um, consultants get kind of lazy sometimes and like, hey, we know trains work and we know buses work. So we're just going to keep doing buses and trains because we know they work. And if we tell you to do buses and trains, there's no risk to us because like we know those work there. Never be our, if it doesn't work, it won't be our fault. But what happens is we just get more buses and trains. Sometimes that's the right answer, but if that's the only thing you consider as part of the solution set, you're missing out on potential benefits elsewhere. So this is the, the slide that the transit agencies really have a hard time looking at. Um, as of 2021, for every dollar of fare that was collected from a transit agency, that covered 13 cents their operating cost. So 87 cents was unfunded. So they got to get money from the federal government or they got to get other funding sources. This is an unsustainable financial model. Now you can say, oh, the, but transit is publicly operated and publicly funded. Yes. So it's, it's for the good of the people. It doesn't have to make money, but it can't lose 87 cents on the dollar. That's not something we have to find a way to get this to, if you, if I could, if I had a magic button, I could push and make this 40 cents on the dollar. Every transit agency in the country would, would pay me to come do, talk about it, right? It's not, isn't that simple. It's a complicated problem, but this is too low, right? Trolley buses, 5%, light rail, 7%. Um, these systems are not performing and obviously COVID had a big impact, right? Post COVID people went remote. They didn't come to city centers. City centers are now going from office to residential. Everyone's modes of moving around are different. And so we lost, we went from 32 cents down to 18 or 13 cents. So what we're doing right now, perpetuating that forever is not sustainable. We have to think differently about the next project. So what I'm telling people in Austin, and I'm, I'm interested in telling people here in Kansas City is like, do you want to be the last people that build light rail, a brand new light rail system, the last thing to do? Do you want to, you want to spend $10 billion on the last light rail system? Or do you want to maybe try to do something different and be the first one or one of the first ones to build something better or at least different? All right, so what, what do I, am I calling 21st century transit? I, you know, I didn't really have a good name for this. If someone has a better name for 21st century transit, I'm happy to rebrand this. I, there's a lady here talking about copywriting. We can work on figuring out how um, the copywriting thing is on this. Um, Self-propelled, smaller vehicles. So we know BRT is bus rapid transit. GRT is group rapid transit. So 
Buses are 50 person capacity. GRTs are like 10 to 20. PRTs or private rapid transit is four to six. So there's get different levels. So GRTs and PRTs, they're electric, battery powered, and they're all gonna be ADA accessible. So low cost per mile to construct. We got smaller, lighter vehicles. So these are some examples of some of the stuff that's out there. I did work for the boring company. This Tesla is not self-driving in there. It's a driver driving it, but it is electric at least, and it's in a tunnel, so it's kind of cool. If you haven't been to the Vegas Convention Center for a conference and ridden in it, it's cool, right? It's a good concept. It hasn't fully scaled yet, but it is cool. Um, Beep out of Orlando is working on autonomous on-the-surface vehicles. Um, Majitram out of Guadalajara, Mexico, it's on a rail still, but it's more like a roller coaster size rail versus a full massive train rail, so it's a lot cheaper to build. Um, Glideways out of San Francisco is, they say four people. I haven't been in the pod myself. I think it's more like two, but super small, tons of vehicles, constant flow, uh, and personalized rapid transit. <clears throat> and then Oceaneering, this is at uh, Greenville Spartanburg Airport, a project that they're going to put in 10 to 20 people per vehicle um, and fully automated. So, Skip stop, ride hailing is one of the big benefits here. Right now we think transit, you get on a train or a bus and say you're going from stop one to stop 20. You gotta stop at every station. A lot of the time for that trip is just stopping and waiting. I was in Philadelphia last summer and I was on the subway and first of all, massive subway train, super heavy, tons of energy to make it accelerate and decelerate. Tons of wear and tear. But also I was going not very far, but it still had to stop five or six times. If we could go from where I wanted to get on to where I wanted to get off, like you go in a tall building with a, an elevator and you say, hey, I, you push the button. It's like, hey, go to bank, elevator bank four. It takes you right to your floor. It's much faster than stopping at every floor. These vehicles, because they're smaller capacity, allow you to group passengers together to destination points. So if you have a 20 stop system, you can go from stop one to stop 20 or stop one to stop 15 or stop 15 to stop 10. The, the actual programming for that's not very complicated. Um, and so we have the ability to do that, which makes the user experience better. People are rational, right? They'll use transit if it's a good experience for them and it gets them where they need to go and it's cost effective. Right now, transit is almost always slower than driving your car, particularly in places like Kansas City. So they'll, if they aren't driving, they'll take an Uber, which costs 10, 15, 20 times more than it is to take transit. So we have to make transit feel more like a personalized experience to make it more attractive to users. I think I broke it. Oh, there it goes. So when people say, hey, I want a high capacity system, they think I need a train. And they might be right. But places like Kansas City, the streetcar is smart because it's not a full blown light rail system. It costs less to build. It's not as heavy. It didn't cost as much, it doesn't carry as much stuff up. It has some of the same challenges as light rail, but it costs less. So that was a smart choice by Kansas City to not go full blown light rail to go to streetcar instead. But people think, hey, I need, I need rail. Well. The problem is most cities don't have the population density to demand it. And all of these are passenger per hours for existing light rail systems, you know, up to 3,000 passengers per hour down to 270. Um, certainly something that can be handled by one of these GRT systems. Um, I lived in Houston for a while. Houston spent $300 million on a bus rapid transit corridor in the Galleria, a very nice part of Houston. It took them like five years to build it, tore all the streets up, made a big mess. They projected 8,000 passengers a day, maybe 10,000 passengers a day. I want to guess how many passengers they had for the first year, weekday, in that system? It's 250. They predicted 10,000. They spent $250 million on it. Now, maybe if it gets more connections in the future and they expand, it'll get better. Pe people. So, a lot of well, the other problem you have is like the way the system is structured right now as far as how to get transit money from the FTA, Federal Transit Administration, is you project how good your system is going to be. The better you project your system, the more money you can get. So people are encouraged to inflate their numbers, say, hey, our system is going to be so awesome, it's have so many riders, and then it may not. And now you have this massive system with these big expensive vehicles that nobody rides them. The other benefit of using smaller vehicles, if nobody's riding it, you don't run all the vehicles. Right, you run like a small vehicle. At least Houston's a bus, right? So it doesn't have to not, the cost to operate slower than trains. But you still, it's a double, it's a, one of those stretchy buses, right? It has the, the uh, move the thing in the center. It's not, it's not, they're not really called stretchy buses, but Andrew might know. What, what are those buses called that have the, the thing that oscillates in the center? 
Okay, nobody knows. Anyway, you've seen one of those big buses that are like 100 feet long. They're really expensive. An electric bus like that is like $2 million. They got a lot of those in Houston. Nobody's riding them. So everyone always asks me, okay, Brian, like, this is cool, but like, who's doing this? Because I don't want to be the first one to do it. I want to be like the second one or like the third guy to do it so that the first guy can make the mistakes and I'll do the second and third. Public, public agencies don't like being first, typically. They like to be second or third. The good news is people are doing this, right? So Boring Company's got the deal at the convention center in Las Vegas. It's not autonomous, but it does exist. It's using EVs in a tunnel. It's permitted under the National Fire Protection Code for transit. Uh, it's about a mile long. They just add another connection to it. It can move about 4,000 passengers an hour. It's, the user reviews are really great. Once it goes full autonomous, I don't know when that's going to be, it'll be a pretty compelling system. It's all in a tunnel, all grade separated. Move Nona is the project by Beep and Lake Nona, which is a suburb of Orlando, just south, southeast of the airport. That's on grade, mixed traffic, autonomous. Now there's a driver in the vehicle to do intersection, so it's like semi-autonomous. The problem with this is it only goes 15 miles an hour. The challenge here is that mixed traffic is really challenging. There's a, probably a million variables that can happen in mixed traffic, from a bird to a squirrel to a, we were driving yesterday, we saw a fox, like a real fox running around. Um, stroller, old lady walking across the street. Being at grade mixed traffic is very complicated for an autonomous vehicle to do. That's why all the autonomous companies have really struggled the last, really last 12 months. A lot of, seen a lot of money get pulled back out of them is that they, they promise great things and they found that the problem is really hard to solve. It's hard to get perfect. Because imagine what would happen if an autonomous vehicle ran over somebody and killed them. They, they, would shut them. they would shut them down all over the country, right? So the risk is super high for failure. And so, and, and for good reason, right? We don't want these to run around hurting people. It's hard to go full autonomous. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. This project is probably the best commercial deployment. It's about a mile and a half long. It's a pinched loop system uh, in the Netherlands. It connects a uh, business park with, I think, six stations. 20-person um, capacity vehicle. It's been actually operating for 20 years. They've upgraded the vehicle multiple times. They're on generation three right now. And uh, it is commercially active, right? Takes fares, fare collection. They got two guys sitting in a security booth to run the system. Everything else is fully autonomous. But it's fully grade, it's fully dedicated. It's on grade, but there's no access to the lane. And when it goes by a street, like it's like a railroad, right? Arm comes down, so you can't cross. It has a bridge section. That's a pretty compelling deal. If you guys are interested more about that one, I can send you a video of it operating uh, on YouTube. Guadalajara has got a test facility for Magitram. Um, they've been working on some projects in Mexico. Um, being based in Mexico helps them there. Uh, some of the sites for the World Cup are in Mexico. Some of the stadium sites have kind of poor access to transit. They're talking to folks there. Uh, and then Glideways, based out of San Francisco, there's a, a test facility at an old naval base in Concord, California. And then they've also got a project they're trying to get started with San Jose Airport, connecting the San Jose Airport to the Deer Don train station, which is a super critical link for workforce. Right now, I, and I lived in the Bay Area. I had to drive 60 miles to be able to afford to live close enough to where I was working. And so people that are working jobs that are, you know, particularly hourly, they got to live so far away. There's a lot of people coming on Caltrain. It's three miles from the train station to the airport. It takes 45 minutes on transit with three transfers to get to make that make that link. This system is going to connect those um, those two points in like three minutes. So I, mentioned, I was talking about San Jose. Um, that just went through an RFP process as a developer agreement. <clears throat> Ontario Airport in California, um, San Bernardino, so kind of east of Los Angeles, in the, almost in the mountains. Um, they've got a four and a half mile long tunnel they want to build from the airport to the Rancho Cucamonga train station, again, to connect the airport to train. And that's going to be uh, about 24 foot diameter, and they're going to use those vehicles that they're using in the Netherlands, likely, on that project. Jacksonville, Florida, they have a project called the Ultimate Urban Circulator. Um, so over here, the Jaguar Stadium, it's kind of east of Jacksonville, downtown Jacksonville. Jacksonville has a monorail that they built, I don't know, 25 years ago. The plan is initially they're going to run these vehicles at grade in mixed traffic. And then the next step after they prove successful there is they're going to build a ramp and pave the monorail and run the vehicles along the monorail since they already have that structure in the stations. Um, so it's a multi-phase project for them. Again, fully autonomous vehicles, they've got that going, uh, going now. I mentioned Greenville Spartanburg Airport. Um, I was talking to the airport guys today and they're like, hey, we wanna do a people mover at the airport to connect the rental car center to the terminal, but that's gonna cost like a billion dollars, right? Because LAX's people mover costs like $3 billion. Greenville Spartanburg Airport's got like one fourth of the traffic of KCI. 
that system's going to cost them about 50 million to build. And it's less than a mile from the rental car center to the airport, to the terminal. So this is something that, that KCI could almost do with a rounding error on the terminal project, a one and a half billion. Um, but it takes a different approach. Like if we put a big train in, it'll cost a billion dollars, but that's not the right way, um, as we've been discussing. Contra Costa County, which is East Bay, San Francisco, is that a microtransit? BART is really effective in San Francisco, but it stops eventually. It's not effective for BART to keep going. It's not Because again, cost per mile, particularly in California, is probably 500 million. Put a heavy rail in. So how can they get people to the BART stations in Pittsburgh, California? And I got some buddies that work for Cavnew. This is a, a currently mostly a freight corridor, but between Detroit and Ann Arbor and uh, Michigan, along I-94, they're building a connected autonomous vehicle lane that'll allow vehicles to operate autonomously when in the lane, right? So you could, for like a 100 mile stretch, you'll be able to switch off the vehicle onto full autonomous mode. And instead of having all the sensors on the vehicle, a lot of the sensors will be, sensors will be in the road. And so your vehicle onboard sensors are less. Because right now, if you see like some of the Waymo vehicles driving around with a huge thing on top, those vehicles are a couple hundred thousand dollars a pop. So they're not economically viable on a commercial setting. But if we can embed all the sensors in the road and maybe your onboard sensors are only $10,000, now it makes sense to bring those sensors onto the vehicle and use a road that's connected. So some more, like what does this look like? What does it look and feel like from user experience? It's gonna look and feel just like the streetcar or just like a light rail, or just like the air train at the airport. Level boarding, standing access, unassisted ADA accessibility, right? Everyone needs to be able to access it. Roll on, roll off capable, if you're dragging a big bag, uh, that works. Autonomous, or at least automated. There's a definitely a distinction between automated and autonomous. The problem right now with autonomous is that having perfect autonomous is really hard. If you have a dedicated guideway, automated is good enough, right? It still has obstacle detection. If something gets in the way, it'll stop but it doesn't have to make as many decisions. Therefore, the tech is a lot simpler and it already exists today and can run that way. Battery operated, so there's no reason, to, no need to run voltage wires along, right? Everything's run on a battery. Um, because the vehicles are smaller and they weigh less, the grade separation, whether it's above grade or below grade, costs a lot less. <clears throat> right now, San Jose is building a subway to connect BART into San Jose. They should've done this 50 years ago and it would've cost a lot less money, but they waited. I think it's $700 million a mile. It's a 47 foot diameter tunnel. Um, and it's, it, it, in that case, it's probably useful. Like it's so dense right there to get in there, they need it. But that's a 47 foot diameter tunnel for bi-directional trains. This bi-directional system fits in, I'm gonna jump back and go forward. Oh, I was farther forward than I thought it was. There we go. This is a 24 foot diameter tunnel for bi-directional travel. So, Logically, 24-foot tunnel costs less than 47-foot diameter tunnel. It's about one-fourth the cross-sectional area. So it's less dirt to come out. It, it's going to cost at least half to a fourth as much. Um, one, of the big, one of the key features of using these vehicles that are not part of a train is that when you have a station, the vehicles can pull over out of the line, line of travel. Right. The reason the trains can't pass is that there's no siding. There's no way for them to get around the other train. These vehicles are just rubber tired on, on, a, on a road surface. It's dedicated. But when they come to a station, they pull over into the station. So someone who doesn't want to stop there can just go straight through. That allows us to have the point-to-point -point opportunity versus having it stop at every station, which improves the experience dramatically. It, it, it feels like a, essentially a, a personalized closed-loop Uber system or shared ride system just for you and your, and your passengers. So more convenient, because the vehicles are smaller in a transit environment, the, short, the headways have to be shorter, right? If we need to move 1,000 passengers an hour and our vehicle's 20-person capacity instead of 50 or 300, we've got to have more vehicles. So instead of every 20 minutes or 30 minutes, they're every five minutes or three minutes or two minutes or one minute. Or, or as Glideway is, this really small vehicle company is essentially like constantly there's vehicles. That's better for users, right? A lot of people don't like to ride transit because they feel like they have to stand somewhere they don't know for a long time. Right, and there might be, like when I was in Philadelphia, standing on the subway, I was like, I don't super feel super safe down here, and I gotta wait here for 20 minutes, this isn't great, right? And I'm 6'8", so I, I feel like I can take care of myself. Um, but a lot of people don't feel that way, right? A lot of bus stops on the side of the road have no shelter, whether it's hot or raining or snowing. So the longer you have to stand there, the worse it is that you don't have that shelter. Uh, th these, get, these are easier to connect more things to, and therefore they cost less money to build. Um, on a per user basis. 
lower cost to operate. The whole point of using automated autonomous systems is we don't have drivers. <laughs> talk, and, that, and that can go both ways, right? We want to have, people have to have jobs, right? So being a driver is good, but you talk to KCATA or you talk to the airport about people trying people to drive buses, there's no, they don't get applicants. There is no one to drive the buses. Nobody wants to do that. So how do we, those people will need other jobs and there's plenty of things for them to do, but it's really hard to fill those roles. And particularly boring company in Vegas, driving in circles all day, every day, that'll make you crazy, right? So it's not, it, this, there, there are, it, when we get these systems that are simple enough, we can, we can automate these, these functions. Um, we talked about some of those. Grade separation is super critical to these being really fast. The other thing is, when we're building these systems, we're building dumb infrastructure. It's just, essentially the infrastructure for this is just a road, right? It's a paved surface. So in 10 years, in 20 years, when there's a better vehicle, we just put a better vehicle in the system. There's no like, oh, swap it out. We got to spend a bunch of money to change the track, or we have to change the voltage on the wires. Like, none of that happens. Has anyone been to Bush Intercontinental Airport in Houston? A couple. Did you guys ride the inner terminal train in the basement? Yeah, that was built in the 1960s, and they wanted to change it for decades, but that's the only vehicle that fits. It was built like right after Disney. Like they built Disneyland train, and they built, and Disney helped them build that train. But it, nothing else fits, and so they're kind of stuck. And they had, the company that made the train stopped supporting it like a decade ago. They're making their own wear parts. But that, that's what, when you build a specific system for something, that's what you get, is you, you're stuck with that manufacturer forever. No matter how good the company is, nothing's around forever, right? And so building dumb infrastructure, just a road surface, lets the vehicles be the solution. So 50 years from now, this is still better because let's be honest, car technology is gonna keep getting better and better and better and, and have more features. So CES this year, uh, a few of these guys rolled out new vehicles, Holon, Zooks, and, and ZF company out of, out of Germany. Um, these are gonna be production 2025, made in the US. This is like almost the size of a small bus. It, these are intended to be fully autonomous at grade vehicles. Again, that's a hard challenge, but you put these on a dedicated guideway, they could operate today with the technology that exists. All right, I talked about dedicated guideways a lot. The reason why they're important, it, it, primarily simpl simplicity, but also we can operate faster. Even if we're dedicated and we're at grade, like say we built, put a bunch of pylons along 18th Street, right? Someone could still walk across in the way. Right, the, the vehicle speed right now is limited based on the sensor technology, which is getting better, but typically around 25 miles an hour. Like at 25 miles an hour, if you walk in front of it, it'll stop. If it's going 40, it'll stop after it runs over you. So that's not very, that's not very helpful. In five or 10 years, it might stop before it runs over you. But right now, that they're speed limited based on their sensor tech, right? How fast can it process what's happening in front of it, tell it to stop and actually stop. If your grade separated above grade or below grade, there is no cross traffic. Right, there's no people crossing, walking across. You can go much faster. And so even when you see like streetcar, streetcar could go faster than it goes, right? The vehicle could go faster, but it's limited on speed, but for safety. If we can grade separate in a tunnel or above grade, we can go much faster. And because these vehicles are smaller, way less, grade separating costs less, which makes it more realistic to happen. I like tunnels, I'm biased. Uh, if you go to my LinkedIn page, my wife makes fun of me because I put Tunnel Evangelist on there because I talk about how great tunnels are all the time. Um, my wife is here, so I feel like I can make fun of myself in her words because she'd do it if I wasn't doing it myself. Um, the biggest benefit here is making the tunnel smaller, right? We can go from a 47-foot tunnel or a 40-foot tunnel to, or most subways are twin 20-foot tunnels. In this case, we can build a single 24-foot tunnel to provide the bi-directional traffic. It allows vehicles to pass permitted and compliant with NFPA 130. Um, there's no high voltage down there, right? So if you had to get out of the vehicle, nothing can hurt you. It's just a LED lit white painted tunnel with a road surface. Um, tunnels allow us to follow public right away with no impacts to surface. So right now we could be build we could be building a tunnel under this building and you would have no idea. There are no vibrations, there's no sound, you wouldn't know. Um, now we would have to get permission from Kevin to do that, but once permission is granted, you can tunnel under anything. But most of the time we follow public right away. In Kansas City, if we were gonna do that, we would, we would talk to the city, get permission, go to city council, get a, uh, a franchise agreement with the city and say, hey, we want to tunnel under 18th Street for five miles. There'd be no disruption along 18th Street for that five mile stretch until where you popped up and put stations. So it's a much less disruptive than what we've seen along Main Street for the uh, streetcar system. This, 
still cost more than at grade. So at grade is cheapest, most disruptive. Tunnels are most expensive, least disruptive. And elevated is in the middle, right? The problem with elevated is you have to look at it. And it's not going to look pretty and new forever, right? So we see a lot of elevated highways that look great, and then they don't. Um, but elevated has a lot of benefits over at grade because it doesn't have those interactions. Now, should we build an elevated system along 18th Street? I, probably not, right? That's not going to look right. It's not going to feel right. But there are places we're going elevated. It does make sense. Um, 20 foot wide. This is text dot, but you can say K dot or Mo dot. The whole point of this is make it standard to make it cost less. So a standard bridge design would work. And because again, vehicles weigh less, the spans can be longer, uh, and it just costs less to build. This whole, all of these vehicle manufacturers right now are trying to make the user experience as good as possible. Like dynamic screens, you can have touch, touch screens to tell you where you want to go. You can have advertising that's, that's synchronized based on where you're going. Um, the amount of data that exists, you guys I'm sure are aware out there about you and about us and where we're going is pretty incredible. This is trying to harness some of that to make the user experience excellent. The other thing about this, people hate transfers on transit, right? They hate having to ride a bus or a train somewhere and get off and then get on another one. It's like no one likes having a connection on an airplane. I, I don't at least. You never know what's going to happen when you're on a connection. I've had to sleep on the floor at DFW airport before. It's not pleasant. Um, so you want a direct flight. If you could have a direct transit experience, that's also awesome. Even if it turns right, turns left, you know, it can, because what we're talking about building here is essentially a road, right? There's on ramps and off ramps. Um, there's no special tracks that have to be put in. It's just a, the vehicle turns, just like a vehicle, it's like a car turns. Um, the, the stations don't have to be massive. The stations are sized based on how much capacity you need. So we could build a system in Kansas City where, say there's a station at Arrowhead. It might have 20 loading bays or 50 loading bays or some massive number of loading bays because it we have a huge surge capacity. There might be a station right in front of this building that has one bay because the in and out of the traffic at this point is much lower. And that's something that can be studied and figured out. So all your stations don't have to, like with a train, all your stations are massive whether you have 10 people getting off or 1,000 people getting off. This is more custom based on how many people are getting off at that single point. So I'm biased that this is better than light rail. <clears throat> I, and I'm, again, I don't think the streetcar system is bad. I think the streetcar is a great initial investment. But the question is, when Kansas City is thinking about going east-west, there's no, there's, the streetcar line is not going to turn. It's a separate system. Now, it could be a streetcar. But should it be a streetcar or should it be something else? When you want to go to the airport and it's a long way, what's the best way to get there? If you have to make 20 stops from downtown to the airport, nobody's going to ride it, right? It has to be, you have to be able to go direct downtown to the airport. Now, maybe the solution right now is, is the, the max bus. Maybe that's the best solution for now. But like as we get better and think more, what can we do that's different? So cost less, it's less impactful. Whether it's at grade, above grade, or below grade, this is going to be less impactful than building a, a railed system. Faster service, it's adaptable, future technology. I think that's a huge point because we're talking about generational investments, billions, of, you know, millions to billions of dollars that you want to have benefit for for 50 or 100 years, right? Not, it's not like you buy a computer and like two years from now, you're like crap, or like a TV. It's like, man, I bought that TV and now it's, like, it's at Costco for half the price I bought it for last year. We want this thing to last and be, and be, and be good for everybody for a long time. It's built for the rider and it's expandable. There is a future where we have a streetcar-like system that covers Kansas City Metro. Like you can actually use transit effectively across the entire metro area. That, that exists. I don't know when it's gonna happen, but the technology is advancing to a point where it could be possible. So we need a system that's flexible that allows us to expand and extend it. Because the problem with, with a, a rail or streetcar system is that eventually, the longer you extend it, the more stops you have to add, it becomes not fast enough, right? If the streetcar system had to go all the way to, say, 119th and Metcalf and Overland Park, there would be like 50 stops to get downtown. It would take an hour and a half, and nobody's going to ride that. So how do we supplement what, the core that's already built with, with different technology? So brainstorming, what, where do we start? Like, I'd love to build a system at the airport, but that's like 20 miles, and it's going to cost, even with this method, a lot of money. And people are risk averse. So how do we start something. So maybe we build a two-mile system right in front of here. 
from the streetcar line to 18th and Vine. Or we build a system that's less than a mile from the rental car center at the airport to the terminal. So you don't have to get off and get on a bus. You just walk right out of the terminal, walk around a vehicle that's waiting for you, and it takes you right to the rental car. And then after that, we extend it to long-term parking or to the Marriott or off campus to some workforce housing they could build. But the problem is, and I found this when I was at Boring Company, people are like, hey, this is a cool idea. No one wants to jump in and build a 50 mile long system. It's too much to invest in new technology. You gotta start small. So we, were, we would focus on one to two mile long systems that were useful. So convention center is a mile in, in Las Vegas. It's like, I don't have all the answers, but like where in Kansas City is something that's a mile, two miles long, where there's already stuff to connect. And then we can build more stuff along the route, right? Or we can make it longer. I mean, maybe, maybe the pitch is like, if you wanna go east to the stadiums, why not go along Truman or 18th Street instead of 31st or 33rd Street? I don't know, right? Um, I think Linwood and 31st are good enough routes to go east-west. It goes to KU Med, right? But maybe there's other routes that are, that are useful as well. I mean, the whole east side of downtown has been historically underdeveloped, right? And so how do we energize that? Accessibility energizes things and it, when it attracts investment, just like the way streetcars attracted investment. So I think that's all I got. Open to questions. You guys look very attentive, so you get to go first. I'm the host, I get to go first. Oh, that's okay. usually the way that works. Um, so I do have a question for you. So you're talking about uh, guided roadways, um, this idea of smart pavement. And I've seen there's actually a startup here in Kansas City that's been kind of a pioneer in this for quite some time now. Um, is that, so do I think of things that are on the side of the road that like help guide the vehicle? Is this integrated technology in the actual laying of the pavement? Is it a combination of these things? Like how do we think about guided roadways? Yeah, great question. So the answer is it depends on the vehicle, right? So the vehicle that's operating in the Netherlands that they, uh, the Greenville Airport's gonna use, it, it actually follows a magnetic anchor in the road surface. So it's like about the size of a nickel every 12 feet. And it, it uses that plus other sensors to center itself. And it follows at about a quarter inch accuracy. Um, if you guys have been to Universal in Orlando, Florida, um, two of the rides there use the same tech. The King Kong ride and the Fast and the Furious ride are actually the same tech. If you look at the satellite image of Universal and you see the King Kong ride, all the asphalt treads are in the same exact spot because they're using the same tech. Um, that's that vehicle. Other vehicles like Cavnew on the 94 corridor in Michigan, a lot of that is, is tower based, right? Um, some of it's pavement. Some of the interesting things about pavement is like, can we charge the vehicles while they're driving? That's complicated, um, but that's an interesting deployment because at some point these vehicles have to get charged, right? They could charge them at stations, but could we charge them while they're driving? Um, how do the vehicles communicate with one another is really important. So having some tower capability, I mean, there's towers everywhere, right? You have data on your phone, but this is a lot of data. And you wanna make sure it's dedicated and it's not gonna go off and it's secure, right? We don't just have stuff getting hacked. So right now, I think depending on the vehicle, it's probably a mix. Some of it's in the pavement, some of it's around the pavement, and some of it's on a tower every you know, 250, 500 feet, half a mile, depending on the kind of different uh, technology they're using. Um, I guess the, the biggest question I have for you is, so nobody builds highways like Texas, Missouri just announced they were going to spend a lot of their stimulus and surplus money on expanding the interstate highway. So, and those departments of trans, uh, transportation, both federal and state, are where a lot of the money is. So when you're having the conversation with them, how do you shift it from just, how can we increase the amount of cars and the throughput on a highway or on a road to something unique like this? That's a great question. And then this is a, a challenge with how, where the money comes from, right? The DOT guys are really focused on moving personal capacity vehicles, right? And that's important. Nobody wants to, I've sat in traffic plenty of my life. I had a two and a half hour commute when I lived in California and it was un unpleasant. But FTA covers transit and is, and is also well funded. But what we wanna do is we have a certain right of way that exists. We can take Kansas City, you can take I-35, you can take I-70, you can take 71 highway. That right of way is dedicated to moving people. Right now that is focused on single capacity vehicles essentially. How can we, utilize that same right away with for more people and things. That might, that might mean adding a lane, which is what like, people typically see. And, that, and 
Texas does a lot of it, but they also hate it, right? I, Austin and Houston are fighting TxDOT tooth and nail not to widen I-35 and I-45. Having been on both of those highways, they both need something different done. But, you know, what the solution is, it may, it may be different. When we talk about dedicated lanes, you, people think about HOV lanes or express lanes or toll lanes. This system essentially is like, hey, we have this right-of-way width. What if we put a tunnel under it for transit that's dedicated? Or we put a elevated structure in the same right-of-way over it dedicated for transit? Because if the transit has to mix with the traffic, then in the, tra the transit's in traffic too, and it's not any faster. But it, I, I know personally from being in San Francisco, when I was sitting on the highway in traffic and I saw the BART train fly by, I was like, man, I really shouldn't have driven to San Francisco today. I should have taken the train. And that, that's like the best incentive to use transit. It's like, man, I could be that guy sitting there, hanging out, not driving my car, uh, and, and instead I'm sitting in my car in traffic. We have to make transit attractive to two groups. It has to be attractive to people that are transit dependent, that need it, they don't have a car, so it has to serve them. And it has to be attractive to choice riders. Choice riders are people that have a car and choose to use transit because they want to or it's rational for them to do it. That's a really difficult thing to merge. And right now, transit often is focused on one or the other. I think this new tech has the ability to merge those. It's never going to be a perfect union, but can provide benefits to both groups at the same time. And, and use that right away with to move more people through it, not necessarily all in their car. I think when people think about transit, they hear, they hear the same thing. This is going to cost so much money or we'll never get built or, you know, we can never get everybody aligned. And I was at the airport talking to them here and they're like, oh, we want to build a people mover, but it's going to take us like 10, 20, 30 years because it's going to cost a billion dollars. Like, well, what if it's like hundred million? They're like, oh, well, like that's like a rounding error in the terminal. So you have to figure out like what people's preconceived notion is that's stopping. It's often financial um, or they have a, like tunnels. We are like, oh, we can't build a tunnel because it, it's going to shake their, my house will fall down or it's going to create a sinkhole in the street or it's going to, you know, all these, all these things that probably aren't true prejudices against the thing um, and help break those down. I think Kansas city's at a bit of a Renaissance now. I mean, you've got having great sports teams helps. I mean, I grew up, I was born in 1985, right? So I've seen the chiefs and the Royals be terrible for most of my life. Um, and I've, we've been blessed to see championships on both sides, but you've got NFL draft, you've got the world cup. We have things, we have a new terminal at the airport and we just, momentum's a real thing, right? So like, how do we keep that going and not just say, oh, we got the terminal at the airport, now we're done. It's like, what, what, how do we use the World Cup to advance more things? And that was part of the bid for the World Cup. It's like, how do we use the World Cup to benefit the community, not just for the event, but perpetu you know, for generations after that? Um, so preconceived notions and then act, use momentum. Part of momentum is like, don't try to eat the whole elephant at once. Like, I would love to talk about airport to downtown that's too big an animal to try to slay. Like, I'll be trying to kill that for my whole life. But maybe the three quarters of a mile from the terminal to the rental car center is something we actually could slay. And then we could make it a little longer and then a little longer. And then we prove the technology works so we can make it go from KU Med to Arrowhead. And then we can make it go, you know, you got a step function. You got to small, stack small wins on top of one another. Great question. Thank you. How, would you, how do you think we will grade during a FIFA, assuming no transportation? Uh, measures change in from a to f and why so I'll, I'll compare it to what i saw happen in austin when they had the formula one race the first time uh because or, or i guess my did you ever remember the royals world series parade trying to get downtown Callie, how long did you wait with my parents at the bus stop i was on an airplane to california for a business trip how long did you wait at the bus stop till the bus never showed up yeah. And then finally you drove and parked at a friend's house and walked. I don't think we appreciate how big of an event that is and how long it lasts. So, I mean, but there's operational things you could do. Like there's, there's no way we can build one of these systems from downtown to Arrowhead by 2026. It's just, I wish I could say it was, but we live in a society that's very litigious and takes a long time to get processes put together. But maybe the solution is like, Hey, we close Linwood except for east-west traffic. And we run buses like constantly back and forth and for that two-week period. Is that, is that gonna cause some problems? Yeah, but at least it, it helps solve a problem in the near term. And then we can roll that in again, momentum into a, long, a longer system. Um, but we have to get people from place to place. And I think we also want to make the best impression about Kansas City for those people who may never have come here before and want them to either move here or come here again Right? And so we want to have their experience from when they land at the airport, which is now going to be much better. Um, 
I've, I've been blessed to live in Texas for a while. So Houston Hobby, Austin Bergstrom, new airports, right? You fly in, it's like, oh, this is, you're in Austin. You can tell you're in Austin. Now Kansas City has that, right? We check that box. But how do you get from the airport to downtown? What's that experience like? And we got to keep checking those boxes for people that then benefits them for that event, but then also can benefit the rest of the community for the rest of the time after that event. If you had to give it a grade, what would you grade it? I think there's enough intestinal fortitude in the city for it not to be a problem that I'd probably like a C minus. Like, it'll, it'll be okay. But I think the, the backbone plan, like we'll just bus people around. Arrowhead's kind of far. And that's a lot of, there's a lot of stops. It's so like, how do you make the, okay, so we're gonna bus people. How do we make that as good as possible? Like just driving people along I-70 is not, not to be the way. Like how do we make it better? But the problem is time is a problem. And it, oh, 2026, we have time. No, we don't. You should have started building that thing like five years ago if you wanted to actually do it. So how do we then, the next event? I mean, the, the Royals want to move downtown, right? In my opinion, I'm okay with that because I think the Chiefs will then build a new stadium at, at the same site and we can have a Super Bowl here eventually. So when, when, how do we get for the next event, how is it ready for that? Like the World Cup might get the process started, it creates some momentum, then how do we capitalize on that for the next event? It, it depends on how much alignment exists in the community to solve the problem. Um, there's two ends of the spectrum. You have China, which will just go bulldoze a whole town and put something through in six months, which is not the way. Um, and we have New York City, which takes 30 years to build a subway line. <clears throat> I think realistically, if we started, if there was buy-in that like, hey, we wanted to build this east-west corridor today, from like designing it to building it, it's probably like five years. Maybe a little less on the, or a little bit more, like depending on how optimistic you are, but probably about five years. Um, the good news about these, these lighter systems is they don't take as long, they're simple to build, right? So once you get going, you're just building it. Um, but there's a lot of public impacts, a lot of public meetings, a lot of get, gathering feedback from the community about what it looks like, how it feels, where the stations are, how big they are. Like there's a lot of stuff to process, um, but we have to have some, omit, some or, it's good to have a deadline, right? Because then it forces you to do it. When you have no deadline, public projects lag, right? They're notoriously behind schedule. But we have to have something to hold them to. So Mahomes' this contract's a good one. <laughs> Brian, thanks for sharing your information. Thanks for sharing your expertise with us. I really appreciate it. I think everybody appreciates it. And uh, if you got a few minutes to stick around, maybe answer some other questions for folks individually. Um, but definitely appreciate you being here and, and sharing with us. Yeah, so, thanks, guys. Everybody.